Hello, everybody. Well, thank you. That's great. A pause before I even started is awesome. That's a good. <laughs> that's a good response. So I am a student of patterns. And when I say I'm a student of patterns, I mean that I have studied patterns my entire life and have used that curiosity to move into my professional endeavors. My background in college is art and photography and writing, and that has been great for me. But I put it off to the side and I started to explore alternative health. So I've been a massage therapist for about 20 years. I have about 20 years experience with Reiki, which is a Japanese hands-on healing modality. And I've also branched off and studied five element patterns in Chinese face reading, and also dabbled a little bit of some information in Ayurveda. And my goal is to use some words that maybe you're not familiar with, or maybe are a little bit familiar with, to just create this idea of curiosity. I want you to be more curious about your world. I've studied with some interesting people um, that most people in the general medical field have not heard of, but boy, did they help me learn a little bit more about patterns. Uh, matrix energetics, I learned from one of the 35th Grand Master of Shaolin Kung Fu on, on uh, energy patterning, which is such a cool study. These books have gone international. This is a local community, me teaching other seniors, actually, how to do pattern building and drawing. And they now have the bragging rights also because I've got some student submissions. And I say student submissions as in that they are 50 plus. They're at the Allen Rec Center and are students of mine that way that are now published in these books. There's a really great story about the Artful Mandala and how it came to be, is that we were working so quickly to get it out to you, the public, that they allowed student submissions. And so these wonderful ladies are now in uh, both of these books here. When I say student of patterns, my job is to have you look for patterns. So just by a show of hands, how many people come to the Spirited Women all the time or are frequents? Okay, wow, that is awesome. How many times have you looked at the patterns in this room? Do you notice the artwork that is on the walls or does it come like into the background for you? Have you noticed the pattern of the lights on the steps? You know, there's these small little patterns in the grain of the doors. There's the jewelry that you all wear, the textiles of your own clothes. There's the tread on your own shoe. There are all these different things that you might not think about that I do that I want you to become curious about. Think about where patterns come from and how they can reflect curiosity in your life. So, what do we have here? Cauliflower. And what do we have here? Cauliflower, yeah. <laughs> These are two different kinds of cauliflower. So there's magic in this cauliflower. There is a mathematician, his name is Beno Mendelbrot, and he was checking out cauliflower one day. And through the art of observation, he actually created a mathematical sequence that is now known as, he is the father of uh, mathematical fractals. What he realized is that if I take a small little bit of cauliflower and I move it away from the larger bunch, I take a little floret, that little floret is the same as the larger bunch. The only thing that's changed is scale. In other words, how big it is. But it still looks like a baby cauliflower. So in his mind and his observation, he was wondering, there's got to be a mathematical equation that this greater and the lesser, the micro and the macro, are represented to the same. There's got to be an equation for this, for it to be showing up in nature this way. So he has this quote, and it says, bottomless wonders spring from simple rules which are repeated without end. And when I think about this, I know he's referring to how cauliflower was showing up for him, but I think of when we drop a pebble in a pond and those ripples begin to move out, the scale changes. You know, they, they get a little bigger as they move away from that drop in the pond. But there's something magical about how those patterns repeat. And it's through those ideas that we can get ideas of how patterns work in nature with us. He also says that the beauty of geometry is that it is a language of extraordinary subtlety that serves many purposes. That means that when we study shape, and design, 
that there is something more that we can get from these places that are often overlooked. And it could be something as simple as cauliflower or something as complex as the tread on some shoes or it can be something as magnificent as say architecture. And when I say architecture, I'm talking buildings, but I'm also talking about nature's architecture. It's all about geometry. So here is a piece of bell pepper. I am known for cooking in my kitchen and stopping on a dime and saying, where's my phone? <laughs> I have to take a picture of this. I am fascinated by what nature shows me. I love that this red bell pepper actually has three obvious colors. It has the red, there's some orange, and there's some green. And there's actually some subtleties in there, a little bit of white. But most people just kind of cut that out and they keep going because they're looking at red bell pepper. But what I want you to do is start to look at the things that nature presents itself in a way that gets you curious. This pattern down here with the fountains is all about geometry in a way that you might not have seen before. You're just walking by this fountain. This is in San Antonio. But every plant has its own shape. The way that the, the fountain has a triangle in the middle and the circular motions around. There is beauty in the subtlety of the way that this fountain is unique than any other fountain that's in San Antonio. This corner picture here I put up here because one of the studies I've done is Chinese face reading, which means that the patterns that you have in your face are unique to you. And they're also unique to culture. They're also unique to our ethnic backgrounds. And even as something as subtle as the way that we have our eyebrows represents a little bit of how we want to be seen by the world and how the world sees us. And it's these little patterns that can get us curious about knowing a little bit more about each other. Here's patterns that I have just taken photos of just whenever I see something interesting. This one here that's at the top that is the red background that has the white on there. Does anybody know what that is? Yeah, someone says it looks like an upside down turtle. Any, any guesses? Candle wax? Oh, that's a good guess. Okay. Oh, soap dish. oh, a soap dish? Ice. Ice. It's hail. It's when we had those really big hail storms back in April a couple years ago, and we were getting some really unusual pieces of hail. Now, I don't recommend you go and check out the hail during the hail storm. <laughs> I want you to be safe, but I also want you to be curious. I want you to see things in a way that maybe you wouldn't have noticed before. Hubcaps. Have you ever noticed the patterns on hubcaps? They're all circles. That shape is not going to change. Or the wheel itself. It may not be a hubcap. It might actually be the wheel itself. But they're different. Some of them are in color. Some of them are pretty blingy. They're really fancy once you start looking. If I asked you to recall the hubcap on your own car, could you do that? No. No. Most people can't. I asked this question to somebody else and I realized, I don't know mine. <laughs> and then I had to go look <laughs> just to see what mine looked like. Now I remember, now I remember. But these are things I want you to be curious about. Start looking at the patterns around your world. So my curiosity in patterns has actually led to these books. And I'm going to talk a little bit more about these books uh, in a little bit, but I, I just want you to realize that it's the curiosity of the world around me. It's looking at how patterns develop into magnificent things that start out as simple patterns, can develop into something that you're touching now. Here are just some designs that I've done that are pen and ink. In other words, they weren't designed necessarily to be colored in, they're just pen and ink. And the way that I like to approach this is, I like to show you how something like this started. This one is actually a square plastic, plate and shot glasses <laughs> and it's just tracing things complexity does not have to start out complex it can start out very simple and then we just little by little we add to it and now that you can see the shot glass circles the circles pop out to you in a different way and so does the square 
The idea, though, is that when you're looking at it, is that you look at it as a totality, is that you get a feeling of what you see, and then you train your eye to begin to break it down to look at interesting things in small bits. So here's some of my little doodles. One of the things that I really love about this feather in particular is that when I look at this feather, I think this feather has had a life. It's interesting to me. It's not perfect, neither are we. That's what makes patterns interesting. So I love it when people come to me and they say, I can't even do a, a stick figure. Or conversely, all I can do is a stick figure. <laughs> stick figures are patterns, right? So this tree is nothing but stick figures. So each one of these fruit pieces are just large heads of the stick figures. And the way I like to teach is that it doesn't matter what you think you know, it's you just use what you have and you begin to build on that. It doesn't have to be complicated in the beginning, it just has to be something that you can have a handle on and you begin to build on that. You change the scale, change the size. So here's some of my earlier work. <laughs> this is a kindergarten. <laughs> Obviously, I was very proud of signing my name across the whole thing. <laughs> and I'm not quite sure what that thing is in the middle. I don't know if it's a dog or a bear or I don't know. But the sky never touches the horizon in kids' pictures, do they? So here's me. This is me at five years old. And we lived in Arizona, way out in the county. We weren't in the city limits. We were at the base of a mountain, way out there. And we lived where there was horse property. We didn't have horses. But I say horse property so that you can get the visual of that the houses were not really close together. There's acreage. Well, we lived down a cul-de-sac. And we had a really long driveway. <laughs> and I'm up by the house. My neighbors are not even going to find me. But there I am. I've got three pictures. And I remember in my head, I'm thinking about the first person that comes up. I'm going to negotiate with them, and my final price is $5. <laughs> I'm not going any lower. I did not sell any pictures that day. <laughs> but my dad took a lot of pictures from the inside window. So just to get a little science in here for you, our brain is actually developed to bring in information visually. That's our highest uh, context of information processing is visual. So when I'm asking you to look at patterns, it's not necessarily because I want you to see pretty things. I'm actually asking your brain to be active. Our secondary sense is actually hearing. The earth has music for those who listen. It's a quote by George Santana. What I like about this quote is that from my perspective in trying to keep you curious around the world, or the world around you, is that it's not necessarily music like the piano, but it's music in the wind. It's listening to the way the birds chirp. In Texas, we have the squirrels that chitter chatter when they're not happy. You know, there's the acorns when they hit the cement. There's the hum of your tires when you're driving. There's music and sound and quality. It's a vibration, and our bodies respond to that. So there's this article that was done by Brain World magazine. And the researchers at the University of California discovered that if you use touch, when you're trying to learn something, your brain can see it better. And they call it brain sight. So what they realize is that kids that have a hard time doing simple math, that if they gave them a box, and they put, say, five blocks inside the box, and put little holes where their hands could go through so that the visual was not there, and they had to figure it out with their hands, they could feel five blocks, and they would ask them to remove two. So we'd move two off to the side, and they would feel that there were three blocks left. And their brain would create a visual of what that looks like. So your sensory perception, it moves to a visual context in your mind. So when you're listening to me and you're coloring, there's a tactile, there's a sensory perception. There, you are using more than one sense in your coloring activity. So there are two easy ways to describe things 
that humans need. One of them is a connection, and the other one is some alone time, right? We need to be able to recharge and hibernate. Um, we know that animals do this, right? We're supposed to be doing this. I mean, we even just heard that from the doctor before about sleep. Sleep is actually very important. Your heart is actually a physical organ that will tell you that you need one of these two things. Your heart will tell you when it needs people, when it needs socialization, when it needs connection. Your heart will tell you when it needs downtime, when it needs rest. So there was an article that I read just yesterday, and it was Secrets to a Young Brain. I thought you might enjoy this. Guess what the first one is? Rest. Ample rest means ample energy, right? The second is curiosity. Ah, oh, this is my favorite. Continued interest in the world around you. That's a sign of being part of having your brain continue to be young. It's, it's learning more things. It's asking questions. When I ask you to look around the room in a different way and I ask you to recall your hubcap, your brain moves. You become curious and now you're all going to go look at your hubcaps when you leave. <laughs> <laughs> and the third is the social connections. Sharing means that we learn more about each other, which results in empathy, and we care, and we have a sense of community. There's a theory out there that if you control who eats with who, that you create separations within community. But if you allow them to eat together, then you can't help but get to know each other. You learn a little bit more about each other, and then you care. But that can be done on anything. There's a great story that I love to interject here real quick, is that my father-in-law passed away this past spring. And my mother-in-law, we weren't sure how she was going to be spending a lot of her time after 57 years of marriage and all of her kids out of state. And the book came out, The Artful Mandala, the first one came out at about the time that we were doing funeral arrangements. And her response to the book and she's got a lot of things going on and she's starting a new life, was this is great and I support you and this is fabulous, but this is not my thing. <laughs> I keep myself busy in the day and she does. But then the night time would come and the house would be quiet. And there's only so much TV that you can watch, right? So then she started to color. Well, we had no idea that that one little, I'll give it a try, actually was gonna touch a much larger community. She ended up starting a coloring club in her retirement community, and there are now 25 women that meet once a week for three hours. <laughs> now here's the cool thing, is that there are other widows that were starting to retreat because they didn't know how to have that social life without their spouse. And my mother-in-law actually created this very safe, playful environment, no pressure, just come color. She only had one rule, you had to buy my book. <laughs> Rockin' on, mother-in-law. <laughs> She's actually creating a community for these other women to not only have young brain, be curious, they're rested and ready to go when they come to these places, they're creating a social connection, they're getting a lot out of this. So I want to ask by just a show of hands if any of you have tried horseback riding or surfing. And have any of you considered yourself proficient in any of these? No? Someone? Okay. How about skateboarding or any type of sculpting, woodworking, uh, anything that's carving? Okay. And are, are you proficient in any of these? Skateboarding, right? No. <laughs> woodworking? Okay, great. Oh, okay. And how about gardening or sewing? And in sewing, I'll say quilting and knitting and that type of thing as well. Okay, and does anybody consider themselves proficient in those? Right. Okay, so just out of curiosity, what makes you feel proficient in any of these activities? Satisfaction, and she created it. She spent some time and she got something out of it. What about horseback riding? Is there anybody here that did horseback riding? Did you? And what do you consider, you, you were somewhat proficient? Yeah. Okay. And how do you, what makes it proficient for you? I stay on. You stay on. <laughs> <laughs> All right, that counts. <laughs> so, you know, does anybody
anybody wonder what the heck does any of these have in common with coloring? Or the idea of even being proficient in any of these with coloring? And so, yeah, some person said there's balance. Well, here it is, it's awareness. When you are proficient in something, your awareness of that thing has altered dramatically. And I'm gonna use horseback riding as, as a really good example. If you've ever gotten on a horse, it is kind of a nerve-wracking thing to feel that high off the ground when us on the ground don't really think you're that high. And the, heart, and the horse starts to move, and you really feel like you are on top of a horse. You're not riding with the horse, you're riding on top of a horse. It becomes proficient when you are riding with the horse. Yeah. So when you're sewing, like if you have a sewing machine, you cannot go any faster than that machine works, right? Otherwise you break a needle or you bunch your uh, fabric up. There's a proficiency in having an awareness. And really what that means is that you are now connected to that experience. And for those that go into more esoteric thought, it's that place where you feel at one, right? You're connected. So it's by starting to look at the patterns of that experience or whatever it is that you're working with. What are the patterns that help you feel proficient? In some cases, it's the colors. It's paying attention to the colors of whatever it is that you're working with. And I like to throw in here, how does this make me feel? Because it's not all in your head. And it's the details. It's the details on how you connect. So when you're riding a horse, you learn how to relax. When you're working with a sewing machine, you learn how to relax. When you're working with wood, you relax. There's a connection between you and that tool. So in Ayurveda, which is a study that is in India that is really a philosophy and a way of life, they have this idea that is called sattva. And sattvic can be a person, a place, or a thing. And in order for it to be sattvic, it really is a place that is without disturbance. Isn't that lovely? Just to think of a place that is without disturbance. It's that place where you get into a zone, right? And so one of the things that happens when you're coloring, or sewing, or drawing, or whatever it is that you find is the most relaxing activity to you is that you are creating a sattvic environment. When you have a sattvic environment inside, the sattvic environment outside begins to reflect that space. So the benefits to drawing and coloring, well, one of them is it reduces anxiety. It's relaxing, it's meditative, there's repetition in the movement, and there's brain focus. One of the things that is so amazing with the brain is that it loves patterns. It seeks them out, it's the most efficient way to work. If it can figure out the pattern, it likes that. When your brain is working with a pattern and has kind of figured out this is what I'm going to be doing for a while, then your creativity can come in and really what's happening is that your conscious mind is busy and your subconscious mind can now communicate in a different way. And I don't know if you know this, but your subconscious mind is actually what does a lot of the thinking. We think it's all conscious, but really there's a lot of behind the scenes work that happens. So when you can create an environment that is sattvic, without disturbance, that they can both communicate together, you really have some magic. It's a place to connect. It's also a place where you disconnect. So what I mean by that is connecting. So let's talk about the social connections with that, right? It's a way to have a coloring buddy or a way where you can show someone, look what I did. But it's also a way to disconnect. If you're a person that has to work with electronics all day, if you work on a computer screen, if you have to work with the public, if you need a break, this is a way to disconnect. It's a way to create a sattvic environment, a place without disturbance inside your body. And then by doing that, you can create that inside your uh, environment as well. Social and individual activity. So the idea is harmony within and harmony without. So I wanted to show this to you. Because I don't know if you have any coloring books. Does anybody have any coloring books? Yeah, good. Yeah. <laughs> oh, that's good. <laughs> So if you don't have coloring books, I want to give you some tips that newbies don't think to ask themselves when they're looking for a coloring book. And it's kind of an important question because you're going to be investing, at least in my case, potentially hundreds of hours. The books that we have here, each one of them has 
100 hand-drawn images in each book. That's 200 drawings in the books combined. I spend, and I know not everyone's like me, I spend an average of six to eight hours on a single piece of artwork. I do not rush them. I do not do them in one sitting. I come back to them. When I feel like I'm getting stuck, I put it down, come back later. Sometimes I get on a roll. Um, I've had my phone next to me and it go ding with a text and I'm on a roll and it will sit there until I'm ready to go and connect with that environment because I have become so connected to the coloring. So one of the things that you want to look for is it single-sided or double-sided. And this is, this is actually within the printing process. If it is single-sided, it means that if you decide to do something that uses marker or gel pens or something like that, you're not going to lose any imagery on the back side. There are some coloring books that are printed on both sides, which is perfectly fine and it's great if you're going to be doing things like colored pencils because they won't disturb the, the image on the, on the back side. It, this is more for something if you're thinking you're going to branch out and explore. Um, what ends up happening is that you have to choose which one you like better <laughs> and color that one first. The books that we have here are perforated pages. Not every book is going to have perforated pages, and it's okay if they don't, but I just want you to know the advantages of actually having a perforated page. I am a huge fan, and I've been watching you guys color because I watch for patterns, is that I am a huge fan of rotating your page. I do not believe in keeping your page still and steady and then having your wrist go into a bunch of funky positions. This is not handwriting. This is not where it stays at one angle and your hand goes across the page. The page is part of the connection. Make it move. Make it easy for you. Create a sophic environment. Don't create disturbances that make your wrist do funny things. Create it so that it's easy. The fastest way to do that is to have a page that's perforated that you can put flat on your paper or your desk that way. It's great for lefties, if anybody's left-handed here, so that you don't have to worry about the binding of the book, which people don't think about if you're a right-handed person. And also, if the, you can take them out, if you really love what you do, they make really great gifts, actually. This is in, in um, the five elements, the Chinese five elements, one of the things that I was studying was that there's an element called fire. It's connected to the heart. And one of the things they say is that if you can get original artwork from the artist, you are getting a little bit of them, a little bit of their essence, a little bit of their fire, a little bit of their heart. And so if you have a page that can come out easily, you can give a little bit of yourself to someone that you love or frame it. I have some family members that have created a triptychs and are hanging them up on their wall. Good quality paper, that goes without saying. Children's coloring books actually sometimes have thinner paper because it's designed to go through pretty quickly. And the what they're calling adult coloring books has a little bit better paper. I don't call them adult coloring books. They're coloring books to me because I'm finding that all ages can use the great art that comes in, the now the variety that's out there. When you're looking for a book, you want to have a variety of images. And I say variety of images for a couple of reasons. Number one is the mood that you are buying that book in might change in a week and you want something just slightly different. So if you have a book that has a lot of variety, you can choose something different in that day because the book actually allows for that. Um, the size of the book, the book that, I, that we have here I really love. It's eight by eight. It makes it really easy to travel. It fits in most purses and bags and backpacks. There are some that are tall and skinny and those are great if you have the space to go up high. What I have found is that people that travel on airplanes, that long skinny um, coloring book doesn't fit well on that little fold out uh, tray that you have in an airplane. And these are things you wouldn't think about. So if you travel, think of something that might be smaller like the eight by eight. And I like to have this idea of how does it make you feel? Is this something that you want to share? All ages, coloring books are for all ages. And regardless of your art background, so I just told you that I had ladies that, that are 50 plus at the rec center over there that are now published artists and they did not have art backgrounds. So that doesn't mean anything to me whether you have an art background or not. I would rather you start with what you have and just play. And I want you to be curious. Now if you can combine these things, with some nice music. I'm gonna put on some music for you just so that you can have five or 10 minutes here of just in this environment where it's just relaxing 
to kind of anchor this into your body that you can create this at home. So now that you have this information, I want you to pay attention to how you hold your pencil. Squeezing your pencil does not make the lead dry, <laughs> write any far, anymore. Same with drawing. You can't squeeze the ink out of your pen. So relax your fingers, relax your shoulders, and things you might not think about, relax your jaw and your lips. Turn your paper, rotate it. Sometimes coloring a page upside down changes colors you might choose. The Artful Mandala has more abstract, more floral images. In other words, they're not necessarily any particular theme, which is really great for meditation and just relaxing. The second book is the Ancient Alchemy book. I love this book because my job is to help you be curious about things around you in the world. That book has 100 images of symbols that are important in the world somewhere. And some of them you might not be familiar with, and that's on purpose. And some of them you will be. There's Celtic knots in there, there's Tree of Life, there's the Festival Elephants from India, there's Sakura, which is the cherry blossoms, there's Koi fish from Japan, and in the second book there's a visual index of all 100 images on the back, so you can kind of take a glance of them all the back if you wanted to, and in the front there's information about what some of those symbols mean. So if you're curious, you can maybe learn a little bit about something that's out there. Thank you very much.